Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. I am uh, delighted to welcome you here to the Alpharetta Seventh-day Adventist Church. If this is your first time tuning in, uh, we are especially delighted to, uh, to have you here. This is a little different, of course. This is, uh, this is a recording because there's nobody in church, and it's an uh, it's interesting time that we're in that we can't be here, that we can't celebrate the Sabbath together, but that's okay. God has given us all different kinds of technology that we're able to, to share messages with you, and so we're just excited to, uh, to have you here. And speaking of technology, we want you to follow us on all different kinds of platforms. So you can follow us on Instagram, you can follow us on Twitter, you can follow us on Facebook, and particularly on Facebook because that is where we're bringing you our Sabbath school lessons. Uh, if you go to the church page, on Facebook, you can see us every Sabbath morning, every Saturday morning, starting at 9.30, and uh, we know you'll be blessed by that. Uh, we have an incredible group of Sabbath school teachers to, uh, to bring you those, uh, those lessons. And we have our website, of course, that, uh, that you can go to. It is the most up-to-date website that you can find with all of the church happenings, and you can find that at www.alpharetta.com sda.com and you'll find many things there but one of the coolest things that you're going to find that, that we're going to ask you to participate in is to do a recording and you could do a recording for a prayer request you could do a recording for a praise you could do a recording for a greeting or a children's story you could go right to that page and upload that video and we could take that video We'll use that video. We want to try and keep everybody connected, and I think that is an absolutely great way to do that. Also on that page, you can do your tithes, you can do your offerings. Certainly, we want to try and keep up with that to help uh, support the church. And, uh, and send us. If you don't want to do a video, please send us your prayer requests. Please send us your praises, and we'll be sure to do that. This is a, it's a difficult time for a lot of people, and maybe you know some friends or family members that are struggling during this time. Or well, maybe they have praises during this time, and we want to pray about that. We want to pray for that. We want to try and keep all of us connected uh, and on the same page at this time. I think it's so important because we can't be here that we do that uh, in any way that we possibly can because we love you and we miss you, and we cannot wait for that day that we can come back into this sanctuary once again. We are delighted today because we have Dr. Jeff Marlowe that will be bringing us a message we pray, of course, that, uh, that this is going to be a blessing for you. And as with the Sabbath school lessons and with the messages that you receive during the sermons, we hope that it moves you, we hope that it blesses you, and then we also hope that you take those messages and bring that out to a very darkened world now and be a light among the people that you come in contact with. So thank you very much, thank you for being here, and God bless you all. Hi, Alpharetta Church. Um, Paige and Jack here. We just wanted to take a video to say hello and that we miss everyone. Just wanted to let you know what we're doing. We have almost finished our garden. Have you been planting stuff with me? Yeah. yeah? What have you been planting? What did you plant? Garlic. 
Garlic? Oh, what else? We plant garlic. Mm -hmm. We planted garlic in the fall. What else did we plant just now? Did we plant some zucchini? Yeah. Yeah? And tomatoes? Yeah. Yeah? Did you have fun? Yes. Yeah, we've been having fun outside in the sunshine and even in the rain we've been having fun. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope, though, to be back in church soon. And we just wanted to let you guys know what we are up to while we are all quarantined at home. And we hope you guys are staying healthy and safe. Have a good Sabbath. Say bye-bye. Bye. We miss you. We miss you. Many people believe Noah's Ark settled on Mount Ararat after the flood in what is modern-day Turkey. It's a beautiful sight from almost any angle, but one of the best views of the mountain can be seen from across the border in Armenia. Armenia was the first country to adopt Christianity as its official religion in the year 301 AD. Although Christianity spread here a long time ago, Adventists in the capital city of Yerevan have been praying for opportunities to share a unique message with the people of this large city. Our main goal is to, to spread the Three Angels message here during this area of Yerevan, uh, to serve people through uh, health ministry. After working in this neighborhood as a global mission pioneer for two and a half years, Vegan started this small group of believers. This group is excited to share the Adventist message and found that health ministry is the best way to connect with the community. Over the last year, they put on small health expos featuring lifestyle seminars like the Breathing Free program for people who smoke. Healthy cooking classes are a favorite among community members. They love learning new recipes and tasting the food in a social setting. Some of the members started a call porter ministry, knocking on people's doors. As their group became more known in the neighborhood, they decided to hold a series of Bible meetings in their small rented space. They mailed and passed out dozens of invitations to these upcoming meetings. But just before the day of the event, they were kicked out of the building. It's very difficult and expensive to rent space in this part of the city. So the members did the only thing they could at that point. They prayed. And after a few days prayers, we find building in the same street, two homes after. It was very near, and for us it was really unbelievable miracle that God did. Taking this as a sign from God, the meetings went on as planned. Karina received an invitation from a friend. She was willing to try anything to fill a feeling of emptiness she couldn't explain. About two years ago, I met Vigan. When I heard him speaking, it touched my heart. I began to understand the Bible, and that empty space was filled. Karina was baptized and is now a very active member of the Adventist Church. I became like a new person. I'm more faithful to God now. Wherever I go, I feel a peace and a comfort that wasn't there before. Mission work in cities like Yerevan can be extremely difficult. Church planting can seem like an impossible task at times, but through prayer and God's power, new groups of believers can start. Global mission pioneers like Vegan have found that by using Christ's method of ministry, they can break barriers that they couldn't otherwise. To show people that we are loving them, we are interested uh, in, in them, uh, and we are uh, prepared to, uh, to help them to solve their everyday problems. And I think it's a gospel is the answer to the many problems of the people. Thank you for supporting Global Mission through financial contribution and prayer. Your support is helping pioneers plant new churches in unentered areas around the world. I would like to ask, to pray, uh, that people could know living God and that they could find the rest and peace 
and in Christ alone. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day so far. I am going to share some pictures with you that I have found that I think are pretty cool. And one of them you've probably seen before, if not all. So let's take a look. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen with you. All right. Try to at least. There we go. So this first one you might have seen before. This is a book called Duck Rabbit. Let's see if I can move myself out of the way there. All right, this book called Duck Rabbit is a story where the kids reading the story are arguing whether or not this animal is a duck or a rabbit. And it's hard to read, but this says quack. So if you look here, it looks like the duck bill. You see? So that would be the eye of the duck. But if you look over here, it says sniff, sniff. So that would be the eye of the rabbit. So it look, depends on how you look at it. Is it a duck or a rabbit? So they argue back and forth. Duck or rabbit? Duck or rabbit? Okay, so let's look at the next picture. What do you see? Is it one face or two heads? Well, it depends on how you look at it. You look right here, and you see the white part looks like a vase. Well, if you look at the outline right here, the black part looks like two heads. So it depends on how you look at it, what parts you're looking at. All right, well, look at the white parts. What do you see? Well, it looks like animals, doesn't it? Let me move myself out of the way more. There's a dog. There's a cat. It's a bunny or a rabbit. But if you look close right here, oh my goodness, there's a baby with the mommy and the daddy. And there's a husband and a wife. And there's a brother and sister right there. So it all depends on what you're looking at looking closer, looking at different aspects. And really, you know, it made me think about, um, you know, in life that can be people. You know, sometimes when people look at us, they might see one part of us. Um, and sometimes people might see a different part of us. And sometimes when we're out and about in public, we might be a little more reserved. And when we're at home, we might be very exuberant and joyful and more carefree. But you know what? God sees all of us, every single part of us. And that's what's amazing about God is that he sees everything about us and he loves us just as we are and it reminded me of a bible verse that for the at first samuel 16 7 for the lord sees not as a man sees man looks on the outward appearance but the lord looks on the heart so i want you to be encouraged and feel the freedom that god loves you just as you are and to feel encouraged to be exactly who you are, just as God created you. All right, have a very blessed and happy Sabbath day. Hello, church family. If I had come to you back in February and told you that starting somewhere in March, the whole world will be coming to a standstill, that the streets will be virtually empty, Vacation travel would cease, hotels closed, schools closed, churches closed, people would be losing their jobs, and toilet paper would become a scarce commodity. What would you have said? You would have probably said, you are crazy. 
that cannot happen in this United States. Well, this is our reality these days. These events have led me to better understand some instructions in the Bible. These are found in Matthew 6, verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. These are truly unpredictable times, from a human perspe perspective, that is. Because from God's perspective, none of this is a surprise. Do you feel like you can trust yourself in making good decisions these days? How about the leaders of our nation? Do you feel like you can trust their decisions? Let us remember, the God we serve, He is trustworthy. He's the only one who can save us from the pestilence, and He's the only one who can provide for our family's need and for our church's need in these economically challenging times. But this requires something from us. It requires us to trust God, to put our faith in Him, and to be obedient to Him. Now is the time for us to go from a head knowledge of God to living by faith in God. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Now is the time for us to trust God with our life. Now is the time for us to trust God with our family. And now is the time for us to trust God with our finances. This is not an easy thing for us to do, but let us prayerfully encourage each other to this end. At this time, we have an opportunity to return to God our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, all things come from Thee, and from what you've provided us, we return our faithful tithes and offering to you. Use it to further your work and grow us spiritually by being obedient to you during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
thank you so much. That was, that was beautiful. Um, I used to play alto saxophone, I think, for about nine or ten years. I got to the point where I uh, didn't need music anymore, but I never sounded like that. So, you know, I, I appreciate it. It's just awesome to be in the house of the Lord right now. I'm missing this. And you guys have a beautiful, I was telling Brother Phil here, you guys have a beautiful sanctuary. I've never seen anything so nice in my entire life. So uh, God is blessing, and not just with a building structure, but the ministry that's going to be done. I know you guys are looking for a pastor, so praying for you on that. Uh, the church I'm attending right now, we're looking for a pastor as well, so hopefully there's no competition there, but God's going to provide who he thinks is best for each church. So that's the awesome thing about that. Um, <laughs> really enjoyed the Cho family. I had a little sense of what's going on in my house, that little bit of angst energy, followed by, oh, not again, again, and again, but happy Sabbath for them. That was awesome. Uh, really appreciated uh, Paige and, and Jack, and uh, just showing life goes on. There's th just the imagery of those little plants budding was awesome. It's showing life continues on, even though these are strange and unparalleled times, is what Marjorie was bringing out. But I thought it was awesome how she pointed to the verse I give patience commonly. Matthew chapter 6, read it. It's what got me through school. Do not worry. Do not worry. God is trustworthy. I don't know how many people were present for the uh, Sabbath school this morning. Again, I feel a little, little giddy because I was in church actually seeing the Sabbath school live. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, not, I'm not boasting or anything here, guys, but it's awesome being back here uh, and seeing it live. But Grover brought it, man. Uh, the power of God is upon him. And just as he went through that discourse of how we, how we view God is based on our tradition, our experience, culture, reason, but ultimately by the Bible itself, not being a resource, but the source of who God is. And I think he did a great job of underscoring that. And it's not just the scripture, because we can know scripture left and right. We can quote scripture left and right. But unless we turn to the author of scripture itself, that's Jesus Christ, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that is really what uh, connects us. And so I think he did a great job uh, with that. And uh, finally, uh, you know, Stacy, and forgive me if I forgot anyone here, but I just, it's so awesome seeing a full church service. Um, Stacy with Children's Story about perspectives and how we view God and importantly how God views us. We did not coordinate this ahead of time but you'll see ironically that ties in exactly with what our sermon is going to be about uh, today. So uh, it's interesting how, how God works to bring everything uh, together. So again pleasure to be worshiping with you. Uh, the people that are here and the people that are obviously online in uh, strange and unusual times. There was a psychology professor at a university in Northern California who had a telephone message that went something like this. If you were to call and went to voicemail, it said this. Thank you for calling. I'm going to ask you two questions that I want the answer to that most people never have the answer to. Who are you and what do you want? Two great questions for an answering machine, but also for life itself. Who are you and what do you want? Who are you? Are you a reflection of your name? Now my name's up there. It says Jeffrey Marlowe. Now Jeffrey, ironically, I shouldn't say ironically, it means peaceful in Hebrew. Peaceful. Now I'm sure my parents named me based on what they wanted. It wasn't necessarily what they got. And at uh, Bible study, one of plug Bible studies, guys. I, I'm involved with Brother Phil's Bible study every Wednesday. We're meeting online. Uh, I was at uh, the Bible study that meets usually at, uh, at Barbara's house that Bob's leading out. I was online with that. Guys, you're missing a blessing if you're not connecting. I was at both those studies this week. Actually, for the last several weeks, I've had the opportunity to go to both. Um, you're missing out if you're not plugged in. So this church has resources. Avail yourself of them. Connect with God during the week. But at Bible study this week, we were, we were addressing uh, some of these, uh, these thoughts and ideas. But it's interesting. Um, if we got more instruction on our namesake, who our name is, would that make us who we are? I like this quotation. <laughs> Stop giving children Bible names without Bible lessons. Yesterday, I was robbed by Moses. It's always funny when you, when you speak to, I, I spoke a, a couple weeks ago at a church and I said something I thought was humorous and no one, literally there was no one in the whole auditorium of the church. And I thought, 
I think this is so funny, but no one's laughing, so I'm thinking, is, it th is this really just, yeah. So it's, it's nice that you know, there's people and that kind of thing that, uh, that appreciate this. But if we give kids Bible names without Bible lessons, does that, so if I got more a Bible name and some more Bible lessons, would that make me who I am? Right before the COVID-19 pandemic went out, my wife and I had the privilege of attending our kids' uh, school open house. And one of the projects they had is in my, in my son's class, they had to draw self-portraits and then high school students would come along and they'd actually critique those portraits. So you'll never guess who this is here. Let's see if you can read this here. This fine looking kid, self-portrait. This portrait illustrates you as a kind, fun, interesting person. The color choice looks very realistic and gives the portrait good quality, well done. Fine looking young lad. It's my son, self-portrait. Now, I came across another one I thought was interesting. <laughs> this one, I, I don't know. It wasn't so much the art, but the comment you see here. I bet this picture looks exactly like you. Your hair is beautiful. Uh, I'm not sure it looks quite exactly like the person. Kind of hope not. <laughs> but because the question remains, is it how we, our portrait of ourselves, how we paint ourselves, is that what makes us who we are? Or is it how others interpret that? Is that makes, what makes us who we really are? Today, we're going to tackle what I believe to be the big three. The three biggest questions in life. Who am I? Who is God? And who are they? Only today, we're going to leave here with the answers. Because, you know, it's going to be actually an open book exam. And it's kind of unfair. If you ever had a teacher, I would get giddy when this would happen. The teacher would actually tell you, here's what's going to be on the test. And they're not kidding, because usually the teachers throw that out. In fact, when I, when I have a teacher in clinic, I get excited because I'll give them homework. I want you to go home and read this Bible verse or do this or that. I get excited. But they would give you stuff. But occasionally, teachers say, here's what's going to be on the test. And you'd be like, awesome. Every once in a while, a fraction of a percent of the time, they'll actually tell you what the answers to that question are, and all you need to do is regurgitate that on the test. Regurgitate may be the wrong choice of words. I'm not a professional speaker here. We're actually going to give you the answers to these questions today. There's going to be no ambiguity today. So I want us to pay attention, because there may be a quiz later on. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to lift you up, Lord. We thank you that you are with us no matter what. We thank you that you've set aside this day where we do not need to focus on work, on stress, on school, on the worries that surround us. So, Lord, we put our lives in your hands. Lord, help me to rightly divide your word of truth. Send your Holy Spirit now to every individual watching. Now to every individual watching is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The Israelites increased in number throughout the land until the Egyptians feared that the Hebrews would soon take over. And so Pharaoh issued a decree, a decree that every newborn Hebrew male should be killed, actually thrown into the Nile River. Having been to Egypt, seen the Nile River, it's not a place you would necessarily want to be thrown, um, but it's bad. And there was, a, a, there was a fine young woman by the name of Joshebed who had a young baby boy. And she nurtured and protected him as long as she could at home. But at three months, as those cries became louder and louder, she knew she couldn't go on like this. So she took a papyrus basket. She coated it with tar and pitch. And then she placed her young infant inside of it. She actually did obey the command of the Pharaoh. She put her son into the Nile River, but gently laid him and placed him into a tiny ark under the protection of God. Big Sister then stood off at a distance to see what would happen. And as Big Sister watched to see what would happen, I'm sure the mom was leaving with tears as only a mother can do. Big Sister saw Pharaoh's daughter come down to the river to bathe. And she saw this basket, and she said, what is that basket? She had her attendants bring the basket over. They took the, the lid off the basket, and they saw this tiny, small baby in there, I'm sure by now crying, crying. And she had compassion on him. And so Big Sister got involved. She came over and said, hey, do you want me to find one of the Hebrew uh, women to nurse the baby? And, and, and the princess said, yes, please do that. In fact, I'll actually pay the person to nurse this baby for me. And when the baby's old enough, I'll take that baby to live with me and will be raised as Pharaoh's son 
in the palace. And so the princess named the boy Moses, which means draw out, for he was drawn out of the Nile. And so God arranged for Moses to be raised by his actual biologic parents until what we believe about the age of 8 to 12. He was trained in the way of the Lord with respect and love of the Lord until he was brought to the house of Pharaoh. And so it was in the most wealthy, advanced, powerful kingdom in the known world, Moses was raised for worldly and political greatness. The only problem was Moses couldn't forget his humble upbringing by Hebrew slaves. Those thoughts and those stories that were read to him and told to him about the true God of heaven. Those thoughts and those stories that were read to him and told to him about the true God of heaven. Parents, it is a tribute, a reminder that we need to be spending time with our kids daily in prayer and Bible study. You don't think an eight-year-old is going to transform the world with our kids in Bible study and prayer. If you don't have kids, I have friends that don't have kids, and they never come with our kids in Bible study and prayer. If you don't have kids, I have friends that don't have kids, and they never will have kids, not because they didn't want it, it didn't happen. But they take on kids like you will not believe the Lord. It is a responsibility not just the Lord. It is a responsibility not just for the parents, but it takes a village. That is the responsibility of all of you. But it's a reminder of what can be done both now and for eternity. Moses was conflicted. Looking out from a palace of luxury, he saw the gods and all this money. It was worthless. It was meaningless. But this money, it was worthless. It was meaningless because he remembered the true God. And suddenly it dawned upon him, maybe he would be the one to help the Hebrews rise above the oppression of the Pharaoh and the system in place. The day came when Moses came across an Egyptian taskmaster brutally beating a Hebrew slave. Moses stepped in. Now again, Moses was raised as one of Pharaoh's sons. This guy must have been powerful, one strong dude, because he's, ra he's raised to be a warrior and to be a leader. So I'm sure he was a powerful dude, because he struck this Egyptian taskmaster, and he blows it took, but he killed him, and he blows it took, but he killed him, and then he buried him in the sand. You see, Moses thought he was going to do things through his own might and power, and not through God's way. The next day, Moses happened to be out, and he saw two Hebrews fighting each other. And the one who was in the wrong, Moses confronted and said, what are you doing this for? This is your brother. And that Hebrew who was in the wrong said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you gonna, thinking of killing me as you killed that? Killing me as you killed that? And suddenly Moses realized that his deeds had been discovered. And now Pharaoh wanted him dead. So Moses did what every rational, sane, normal individual would do when someone's trying to kill you. Of course, you take off running. And you don't just run a small distance, you keep running until you're out of harm's way by a lot. And so he kept running and running and running until he didn't stop until he, became, he came to the desert of Midian, where he met a beautiful woman, got married, had some kids, and he followed in the occupation of his father-in-law as a shepherd. You see, the first 40 years, Moses spent learning the ways of Egypt. The next 40 years, God spent taking Egypt out of him. The first 40 years, Moses learned self-reliance. I can do this on my own. The next 40 years, God taught him humility. You can do nothing without me, Moses. It is a lesson we all need to learn. Brother Phil and I talk about this, the importance of humility. Because once we start thinking we got it all put together, I got a job, I got this, I've got, I've got some nice vacations, I got this, I can do good at speaking, I can influence people, I make people laugh. All of a sudden, our pride gets in the way. And as the adage goes, pride goes before a fall. But God is looking for humble servants. Christ took on the nature, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but took on the nature of a servant, setting an example for us. And so Moses learned this valuable lesson that we all need to learn. But the biggest transformation was about to occur. From the palace to a prophet. From a prince to a preacher. Or as I like to say, from a shepherd of sheeps to a shepherd of my peeps. <laughs> it's cheesy, but I like it. All starting at the age of 80. How old? 80. All right, good, good, good. Paying attention. All starting at the age of 80. Moses became an ordained prophet of God at 80 years old. Now I want you to think about that. We put time limits, time restrictions, age limits, age restrictions on people, do we not? 
Kids, this is for you. God can use you. That's why I love those videos at the beginning. Innocent little kids full of energy, full of life. Planting, gardening, full of energy, saying happy Sabbath. You don't think they're influencing people for the, for the kingdom of God? I've read testimonies of people who gave their lives to God based on an experience they had throwing around a ball with a little kid, talking about God when they were a kid. Kids, you can make a difference for the kingdom of God. And for those of you who are graying gracefully out there, <laughs> I just had a birthday a couple weeks ago. Graying gracefully, I like the way that sounds. It sounds so, uh, so nice. For those of you who are graying gracefully out there, God can use you no matter how old you are, no matter the circumstance of your life. And so Moses, at the 80, age of 80, was out tending his sheep when he saw an unusual sight. A bush was on fire, which did happen occasionally, but the unusual thing about this bush is that it did not burn out. It kept burning. So Moses went closer to investigate, and he heard, Moses, Moses. Uh, Moses responded, uh, here I am. What would you do if you heard a voice coming out of a burning bush? We never think about these aspects of the story, but I mean, how I would have been floored. God himself spoke to Moses through that burning bush. Do not come any closer, Moses. The place you are standing on is holy ground. And immediately Moses took off his sandals. Now my house, when we go inside, we always take off our shoes. That's the standing house rule. We don't want clinic germs in there. We don't want dirt getting in there. So we take off our shoes. In Korean culture, it's actually considered extremely rude, extremely offensive. You don't take off your shoes before you go into someone's house. We seldom do this in the Western world. There are cultural differences, which we talked about in the Sabbath school lesson this morning. I am not suggesting we need to take off our shoes when we come into God's house. What I'm suggesting is that when we are in the house of God, we need to be there with fear and reverence and respect and admiration of the living God. Stop running around carelessly, kids. That's what you'll hear adults say. And I agree with that. But adults, are we any better? Yeah, I may not be running around, but I'm not running around outside either. Are we having that respect and awe? Are we talking about a sermon we just heard, a special music that inspired us, a children's story that we found important? Are we praying with a brother or sister in the sanctuary of God? Are we doing that? Or are we caught up talking about sports and politics and current events? Guilty as charged. We do well to remember that when we are in God's sanctuary, we are standing on holy ground. So God tells Moses what's on his heart. How awesome is that? God conversing with another person. And don't think Moses is any different than you are. We could have that same experience where we connect with God more. God said, I've seen the plight of my people. I've seen their oppression. I've seen their hardship, and I want to help them. I'm sending you, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, to my people, the Israelites. Get them out of Egypt. The beautiful thing about this is God still sees our plight, our hardship, our, our oppression, our difficulties, and he wants to intervene. He wants to help out. The question is, are we turning to him? And Brother Phil and I always talk about this. We talk about problems and situations in our life, and then he'll ask me, Jeff, you prayed about it? Well, I, I, I did at first. Are you still praying about it? Um, no, not, not so much. And other times I'll say, hey, Brother Phil, well, how's that going, that situation? What are you doing about it? Well, I, I, I talked about it. I, I tried to talk and seek counsel. And did you pray about it? I, I did. I did for a week or two. Are you still praying about it? Well, did the problem go away? And ke keeping each other accountable as we work towards the kingdom of God, striving for that connection to God. It's important. We have to have godly brothers and sisters in our lives that will keep us accountable. Are we praying without ceasing? The Bible says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It availeth much. That's what we need to have in our lives because God is still willing to help us out. Let's pick up the story in Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. You guys all have your Bibles. We'll be spending our time here today. Exodus 3. And we'll start with verse 11. Exodus 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? 
So we, here we have the first and greatest question asked by Moses. The psychologist at the beginning of, of, the, of the sermon, and indeed we've all asked at one point or another, who am I? Because let me tell you, if we can answer that question, who am I? We'll know exactly what we should be doing with our lives. We'll know our purpose, our direction, our trajectory. If we know who we are, it makes everything else crystal clear. The problem is most people never know the answer to this question. And when they do search for it, you know where they search? Where everyone else searches. Google. Facebook. Instagram. ESPN. Scientific journals. University professors. Who am I? Am I a boy? Or do I identify today as a girl? Or am I one, more than one over the hundred different gender identities available? There is such role confusion today that I fear for our youth. We are headed away from the safety and security of God's ordained roles for us on this planet. And instead of letting the Bible change us, guess what we want to do? We want to change the Bible. I don't like what this says. In fact, the lesson this week talked about Thomas Jefferson redoing the whole New Testament, getting rid of anything that didn't fit with his reason and thinking. We talked about last week in the Sabbath school lesson how if I'm a scientist and I have a scientific background, in fact, some of the brightest people I've ever met are scientific Christians because they interpret the data, they take the same data out there that all, that's all available, and they interpret it based on the word of God, which is why I struggle with evolution versus creation. And now I have a firm understanding and a firm solid belief in a literal six-day creation, new age of the earth. If you have any struggles or questions with that, come talk to me at some point in time. Uh, attend one of Phil's Bible studies. We'll, we bring up these real questions all the time. But are we letting the Bible change us, the word of God? Or we say, I don't like that. That's an allegory. That's a myth. That's a parable. We throw it out instead. Who am I? Am I a student? Sure. I study. Am I a teacher? Struck people quite a bit. Contractor? Eh, some repairs. I put that on the uh, lower end of the list. Truck driver? Eh, not so much. Mechanic? Uh, it's changing oil, tires? Not really. Uh, maid? Uh, clean some. Chef? Absolutely not. That's my wife's cup of tea. Uh, she's, she's solid at that. Am I a dad, brother, husband, son? Yes. Okay. Am I rich or poor, educated, uneducated? Am I a geek or a jock? Who am I? And to answer that question, we need to turn to the source of all knowledge and wisdom, God. So Moses asks, who am I? Exodus 3, verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses asks, who am I? And God says, I'm going to be with you. God is with you. And God is with me. We are children of the king, and there is no higher calling. Right now, there are people today, and I guarantee you there's someone right now watching who is in fear of their health. Guarantee you. This week alone, I've encountered many people in a medical context who are fearful of their health. You need to know God is with you. There are people here who are struggling financially. I guarantee you. I am. I'm not seeing the same number of patients. I only get paid if I see a patient. There are people who are not, have lost their job, and good luck finding a job in this economy. But you need to understand something. God is with you. There are people here fighting addiction. Oh, no, that's an, that's an Adventist. Adventists don't fight addiction. I know Adventists who are addicted to alcohol. I know Adventists who are addicted to pornography. I know alcohol, Adventists who are addicted to smoke. I know Adventists who are addicted to lying. It happens. And we get trapped in this web of deceit. I can't get out. There's no way out. And you need to understand, God is with you. I'm bringing up skeletons in the closet. There are people who are emotionally battered and scarred. There are people who have had horrible things done to their body. I know. I've heard about it. I've cried over things I've heard in the office. You need to understand God is with you. There are people that are celebrating a pregnancy, the birth of a new child. In fact, just this week, my sister-in-law had a child. Awesome. It was not an easy experience. Think she had, the mother thinks she, thought, thought, thinks she had, has COVID, having fevers, oxygen level dropping down, requiring oxygen after delivery, emergency C-section, baby not doing so well, had to go to the NICU right after delivery. 
praying, praying for them, praying for them, praying for them, trying to give some medical insight in a different country where the, the, the rules and regulations are totally different. And by God's grace, that healthy baby and mom is home now. God is with you. There are people right now enjoying and riding on the heights and success of the land. God is with you. And so Moses asks, who am I? And God says, I am with you. And Moses, to show you that's the case, when you've successfully completed the mission of bringing my people out of the hardship and spiritual confusion of Egypt, you will worship me on this mountain. Pay attention, this will come back. But Moses was still unsettled, for he had another pressing question. Moses said to God, Exodus 3, verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses basically asked God, who are you? Who is God? The second profound question in life that people rarely, and sometimes ever, I shouldn't say rarely, some people never know the answer to. And arguably, only because they do not seek God. Isaiah says, if you see, I believe it's in Isaiah, Isaiah says, if you will seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. And it's not Isaiah speaking, he's speaking on behalf of God. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. Oh, I don't read from that, that translation of the Bible. Oh, I don't, I don't like that. Oh, I don't attend prayer meeting. Oh, those, those people are hypocrites at church. Well, guess what? You're not going to find God if you're not seeking him. Are we seeking God? There is a need out there. I have a, a buddy of mine I've been friends with since middle school. I was telling Brother Phil this earlier today. He never talks about God. He's been having nightmares every night about people dying. He's told me twice, he said, Jeff, now you can do what you're passionate about. I'm like, medicine, you know that's not what I'm really passionate about. You know, he's like, you're passionate about God and, and, and reaching people for God. You can tell them, you, you can encourage people. What about you? He said my buddy's name. What about you? You, you? you can be encouraged by this too. He said, I've been having these nightmares every night about death and I, and I, I can't get out of my head. What? Death is nothing more than sleep, my friend. You wake up, you love Jesus, there it is, boom. In fact, I don't take umbrage too many times when people say when you die, you go right to heaven, because guess what? That's not theologically correct, and there's room for deception there, but guess what? When you're a Christian believer, you fall asleep, guess what? No knowledge of the passage of time. Next thing you know, boom, Jesus is there. Take comfort in that. Two times he's talked to me about God this, in the past two weeks. This has never happened before. You don't think God's creating windows of opportunity? And I'm sick and tired of people saying, oh, God's not working on people's lives. That's baloney. God is working on people's lives. We have to be receptive with the Holy Spirit's leading us and directing us. God says to Moses, after Moses asks, who are you, God? Who are you, God? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Moses asks, who are you, Lord? And God says, I am. Not I was, I shall be. Not I hope so, not someday I will be. God is the I am. And I think it's so awesome. You see, all too often we think of God as the God of the past. Oh, that's the God of the Bible. Oh, all those miracles and all those great things, those prophets, we'll never be like those people. In fact, I'll even tell people stories in, in, in clinic about Elijah suffering depression and how he got out. Here's a man of God. And I think, well, I tell them, well, I was never like Elijah. I thought, well, why couldn't we be like Elijah? We're called to be a latter time movement in the spirit and truth of Elijah. That's what we are. And until we wake up and realize that, God's not coming back. He's waiting on us. God's the God of the past, that's what we say, the Bible. Or we say, you know what, no, 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 God's the God of the future. When he will come in the clouds of glory to take us to heaven, that miraculous God will come then, not as the lamb who has slain the past, but as the lion triumphant, the lion of Judah. But what we forget is that God is the God of the I am, the God of the present, which is why he is our gift. He is still working on lives today. Not to plug Bible studies again, but come to a Bible study, you'll start hearing how God is working. I mean, my wife was posting something on social media about someone who had died and made a comment, and the person starts asking biblical questions. This hap it's happening.
God is working today, the I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am everlasting. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am long-suffering. I am peace. I am the balm of Gilead, the rose of Sharon. I am the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. A couple weekends ago, the entire Christian world celebrated what? Easter. Celebrating the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. We recall, I am the resurrection and the life. I am your Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. I am slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Thank you, Lord. I am love. I am the Amen. I am. Who am I? God is with you. Who is God? He is the I am. Which brings us to our third profound question. Who are they? Go, Moses. I'm sending you. Bring my people out of Egypt. But 40 years in the desert of tending sheep had made Moses uncertain, unsure, and almost unwilling. And God said, you know what? Now I can use you. Because before you thought you could do it on your own, now you realize you can't do it on your own, and now a little unwilling? Well, I, I, I'm going to try and work with that too. Who are they, Lord? Exodus 4, verse 1. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to, you, to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? What about them? Those people you're trying to reach and save. What happens if they don't believe me? Who are they? You see, God, I'm afraid of them. What if they look different or sound different? What if they have different worldviews? I mean, they're living in a pagan society, right? What if they eat differently, use bad language? What if they uh, listen to that some odd music with strange beats? What if they even have a tattoo? What happens if those people you are trying to save reject me or don't want to hear your message? What I need to know, Lord, is who are they? Who are they? Notice God's response. Exodus 4, verse 2. Then the Lord said to him, What is that? In your hands. What is that in your hands? There's his answer. A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it down on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. In other words, be courageous, Moses. Be courageous, Moses. That snake you're terrified of, and those people, them, that you're afraid of? I got this covered, man. What's in your hands? Continuing with verse 4. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Who are they? Those people you want me to reach. What's in your hands? What skill, what talent, what thing do you possess that the Lord can use? You see, a shepherd has a rod. A student, kids out there, what do you guys have? Well, now you have like MacBooks or Chromebooks or whatever you have out there. But prior to that, you had a pen and a pencil, right? You can use a pen and a pencil. In fact, my kids just wrote a, a note to their, their grandmother, just encouraging her and spent, sent, colored some beautiful pictures and wrote some encouraging words. Kids, you have pens, you have pencils. Write a nice note. Encourage someone with that. A chef has a pan. Practice some hospitality. Show the love of God. A doctor has a stethoscope. People think that's just for listening to the heart. It's for using that as a tool to reach their heart for the kingdom of God. A contractor has a saw. I've read a couple of phenomenal stories about contractors leaving a Steps to Christ, leaving an invitation to an evangelistic series. That person uh, attending, reading, and they become a Christian as a result of that. 
A salesman has a smile. A businessman has a plan. A teacher or parent has instruction. A grandparent, an encouraging word. Who are they? Those people you're trying to reach. See, everyone's been given a gift, a resource, an ability to reach others for the kingdom of God. Picking up a staff, turning into a snake, maybe is terrifying as reaching for the, sun, for the kingdom of God. But there's three things we need to remember. Number one, who am I? God is with you. Who is God? He's the I am. Unlimited possibilities and ways he can do things. And who are they? What's in your hands? Because whatever you have, God can use it. It is interesting, if you follow this story from that time forward, Moses never referenced it, it, it as his staff from there on. He referenced it as the staff of God, or the rod of God from here on forward. Everything. Everything that we have is the Lord's. It's up to us whether we want to dedicate it to him or not. That's what it comes down to. Back when Jesus walked the earth, people asked him, who are you? Who are you? Who am I? Jesus replied, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know who I am. And that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, or I always do what pleases him. The one who sent me, the Father who sent him, sent him, that is who is with me. So when Jesus asked, who are you? He said, who am I? My Father is with me. The same thing we encountered before. I'm with you. Jesus also answered the question, who is God? I tell you the truth, Jesus responded. Before Abraham was born, I am. Sound familiar? At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Who is God? Jesus said, I am. A declaration of his divinity, which many people couldn't handle, hence the reason why they wanted to pick up stones and stone him. But a direct reference to what he had told Moses back at the burning bush. Jesus is the I am. But Jesus still had one final question to answer. Who are they? Those people he was so desperately trying to say, people like you, people like me. And Jesus looked up to the heavens as a bead of sweat dropped down his brow and mixed with blood and dropped to the ground. And he looked down as they cast lots for his clothing and hurled insults at him. And still that pressing question remained. Who are they? And I can imagine Jesus closing his eyes, and in mind's eye, he looked back through, in, through history. And he remembers the interaction he had with Moses, that burning bush. Who are they? What's in your hand? And I can imagine him opening up his eyes, and he looked to one side, and he looked to the other side. There was only one thing left in his hands. He was nailed to his hands. He had only one thing left in his hands to give his nail-pierced hands, and so he gave it freely. Greater love hath no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friend, John 15, 13. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. And that is why Jesus could say, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know who I am. It is no different today than it was for Moses. It was for Jesus. We're in the same situation. God is with us. The I am who sets up kings and deposes of them is still in control today. And if we don't take comfort and souls from that, there's nothing else that will. He's still in control in a period of disease and hardship and suffering and financial uncertainty. My challenge to everyone here today is to accept that gift of eternal life that Jesus gave us so willingly. But let's not stop there. What's in your hand? to encourage others, to follow the I am wherever he may lead. As the promise was given to Moses, 
when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. That is the same promise for us today. When we have brought the people out of Babylon, that is spiritual confusion, then we will worship God on his holy mountain, which is the new Jerusalem in heaven. May we all be found ready. And whatever our hand finds to do, may we do it with all our might. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this message, this message of hope, this message of reassurance, that God, you are with us, and that is our whole identity. And once we realize that, great things will happen. We are thankful that you are the I am, the God of possibilities and action and purpose. And Lord, we thank you for the challenge to examine what's in our hand to help others, no matter what the time or situation looks like, what is in our hand to help you and your kingdom advance. Lord, be with those who are struggling right now. Be with them in a special way. Help them take comfort in the word of God is our prayer. In Jesus' name.
Let's close with a benediction. It's found in Hebrews 12 too. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen and amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. May we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, is my prayer. Amen. This girl ain't going anywhere. This girl.